Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the first talk in the long term animal research seminar series. Uh, my name is Matthew Zippel, and I'll be hosting the seminar series and introducing our speakers each week. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joan Silk, I'll make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, if you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, you should be able to type any questions that you have uh, for Joan, as well as uh, see and upvote on other people's questions. And at the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. Um, however, if you have a clarifying question that you feel like needs to be addressed during the talk, uh, in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question, and Joan will do her best to answer those questions in real time. Um, second, recordings of all the talks will be available on YouTube after they conclude. Uh, so since this is the first talk and we're, st we're still figuring things out, I'm not sure how long that's going to take to be posted, but if you need to leave early or if you know others who are unable to attend live, the talks will be available for viewing and reviewing after they're complete. And finally, this is the first of 10, at least 10 weekly seminars, which means this is our first time doing this. So please bear with us through any challenges we might encounter. And if there are things that you think could be done better, please feel free to contact me either via Twitter at LTAR seminars, or you can email me directly at matthew.zippel at duke.edu. So now I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joan Silk, who is a Regents Professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Joan is truly a renowned scholar in both the fields of anthropology and biology. She received her PhD from UC Davis and pursued a series of really uh, productive postdoc experiences before becoming a professor and later a distinguished professor at UCLA. In 2012, she moved to Arizona State University and this year was named a Regents Professor there, which is the highest faculty award that exists at Arizona State. Uh, Joan's honors and accomplishments are many. She's a fellow of the American Anthropological Association, the Animal Behavior Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and her publication record is filled with influential empirical and theoretical work. Much of her career has focused on understanding the determinants and implications of social relationships and social behaviors in humans, and across a wide range of non-human primates, including chimpanzees, macaques, and baboons, among others. And what I find really inspiring and illuminating about Joan's work is her ability to connect observations of social behaviors to functional outcomes, which in turn has allowed her to make discoveries about the evolutionary implications of behavioral results, which I take to be the gold standard of behavioral research. So with that, I am pleased to welcome Joan and I will turn things over to her. Hi everybody. Uh, this is really a fun thing to get to do. Um, to to leave my uh, one room house and uh, talk to a whole range of people. The downside of this format is I can't see you. I can't tell if you're surprised, puzzled, outraged. So uh, I, as I was preparing this and thinking about giving it, it, I, it occurred to me that this is a lot like practicing talks when I, uh, when I used to practice talks uh, when I was a graduate student um, and I would just, for some reason, when you practice this talk, you always give it in front of the mirror. And, and I was, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, that's a lot like doing a Zoom talk where you spend the whole time staring at yourself on the screen. And I was wondering why does we always practice talks in front of mirrors? Because it seems really distracting. Anyway, uh, with, uh, let, me, uh, let me start this talk now. Um, so I wanna talk about some work which um, some ideas I've had lately uh, in which I've um, really shifted my focus, which has mainly been for many years on female reproductive tactics and began thinking a little bit about males. And this research builds on years of work um, on baboons and other primates. Uh, and so it's really uh, an exercise in which we're um, adding, I think, a, a sort of incremental bit of knowledge. But it's really satisfying sometimes to put, I think about building a dry stone wall. Sometimes you get to put in the really big rocks, and sometimes you just get to fit the little rocks in, in the interstices between the others. So this is kind of like the latter, but it's been really fun. 
All right, so um, many of you come from the Duke program. You're really familiar with baboons. And so um, none of this uh, will come as a surprise, but we know that baboons are a very successful lineage uh, that have occupied all of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Savannah baboons, the olive baboons, the yellow baboons and the Chakma baboons uh, all share some common features. They live in relatively big, multi-male, multi-female groups. Uh, males compete for high-ranking positions uh, in the dominance hierarchy. And uh, males, as a consequence of sexual selection and intrasexual competition, are considerably larger than females. Uh, they are better armed than females. And males compete over access to females and males commonly mate guard females when they're um, likely to conceive. Um, there is a reasonable amount of reproductive skew in uh, baboon groups. And I've just provided a, a, a diagram of what we now know, what current evidence about the extent of reproductive skew um, in baboon groups. And I think one interesting thing is that in the yellow and olive baboons, it looks based on current evidence that it's generally less skewed than in chakmas, although the data aren't fantastic. I mean, we really need more data on more groups to be certain about this. Okay. The other really interesting thing about baboons uh, is that they also form these really striking uh, um, male-female relationships. So males maintain relationships with anestrous females. And these relationships have captivated primatologists for many years. So in these relationships, uh, males and females spend a lot of time with particular adult male partners. So these are highly differentiated relationships characterized by high rates of association and grooming. And uh, in, in, in several populations, we know that these relationships commonly extend to the female's infants. So males spend more time with their female partners, infants, than with other infants. And these relationships have been uh, known for a long time. So they were described in the 70s and 80s in olive baboons, yellow baboons, and chakma baboons. The one of the uh, I think the, the earliest, one of the earliest explanations of uh, these relationships was actually um, mentioned in a paper that um, uh, Robert Seifarth wrote uh, in the late 70s about the Chakma baboons. But the idea, which was extended and formalized by Bar Smuts, is that the relationships with, between males and females are uh, a form of what we would now describe as mating effort so that females will preferentially mate with males who have established these kinds of friendly relationships with them. Relationships in which the male will uh, preferentially support the female. And then the hypothesis uh, uh, predicts that the female will preferentially mate with the same male when she resumes cycling. And so in modern terms, we would say that the relationships between males and females, then these highly differentiated relationships between males and lactating females uh, are a form of mating effort, which increases the probability that that male will be able to mate with the female when she resumes cycling. And this idea was out there for quite some time. Uh, we, uh, there was not strong evidence that this strategy was successful, but the sort of use of the word friendship proliferated in the literature 
And uh, there wasn't uh, a lot of, uh, I think, controversy about it until um, uh, in the early 90s, Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney started working on Chakama baboons in the Miramie Reserve of Botswana. And uh, Robert and Dorothy noticed, uh, you couldn't hardly miss it, uh, that uh, males, Chakma, in, in Miramie, Chakma males committed infanticide. So either a new male uh, became alpha, he joined the group and became alpha and then started systematically stalking and killing infants, or uh, in another case, a resident male acquired the alpha position and then he started killing infants. And um, uh, I was actually in the field with Robert and Dorothy when they started their work in Miramie. And, um, you know, seeing a male kill an infant is a very uh, salient experience. And it really uh, made us think about uh, male-female relationships in a new way. So the function of these relationships uh, uh, really struck us as an interesting question to explore. And they then recruited Ryan Palombit to study male-female relationships in Miami. And as most of you know, um, uh, the work that Ryan did both observational and experimental, suggested very strongly that the male-female relationships among the Chakmas in Miami really focused on the welfare of infants. And so uh, Ryan's paper, uh, which was published in 1997, showed that um, males were really attentive to the distress calls of their female friends. And I only use friends uh, in scare quotes, uh, but that they were really attentive to distress of their female partners. And at the same time, if the infant died or disappeared, which happened during Ryan's study several times, then males abruptly lost interest in their female partners. And this suggested that the relationship was designed to preserve or, or protect the infant. Um, and that by itself was a really striking observation. And Ryan in that paper actually shows that all of the female's partners or the majority of their partners could have sired those infants, right? They did mate with those females, but he doesn't show that females' partners, lactating females' partners, are the most likely sires of their offspring. But Tony Weingirl's paper uh, is really, I think, the first place uh, where we see an explicit connection between infanticide and the function of male-female relationships. Because what Tony shows is that um, the most likely sires are the males who are likely to form these relationships with females. And he argues that this is a form of male protection of own, their own infants against the threat or risk of infanticide. But Tony's study doesn't include genetic data on paternity. But that idea starts floating around in the late 90s and early 2000s. And so um, according to this alternative, then these relationships represent a form of parenting effort that males mate with females, and then they form these relationships with females uh, and then serve a protective role for females and their offspring, which they're likely to have sired. And as most of you know, uh, when people um, 
collected genetic data and examined the relationship between prime, what I'm now calling primary associations and paternity, they found that primary associates uh, were much more likely to be sires of their uh, partner's infants than you'd expect by chance. So the link between paternity and forming primary associations was uh, strong across the three populations in which genetic data were available. So two populations of chakmas and the yellow baboons in Amboseli. And in two of these studies or in two of these populations, uh, they also found that primary associates are not more likely to sire their partner's next infant than you'd expect based on their rank. So back to all of baboons uh, where uh, Barb Smuts had argued that these relationships were a form of mating effort. What about them? And there has been sort of surprisingly little work on all of baboons uh, in the sort of what I think of as a sort of modern behavioral ecology era. So when I came to ASU, I found myself um, uh, in uh, not exactly possession, but in control of a certain amount of startup money, which is manna from heaven. And so I was able to start a project on um, olive baboons. And I really, at that point, just kind of wanted to connect the dots because I'd worked on chakma baboons and I'd worked on yellow baboons, but there were more baboons in the world to study. So what about olive baboons? And so I made contact with Shirley Strum, who's been running uh, uh, a project on olive baboons uh, in um, Kenya, in central Kenya for a really long time, more than 40 years. And um, she was willing to let me and my team come in and work with her well-habituated, uh, well-studied uh, population of olive baboons. So our study uh, informed by best practices uh, at other sites, uh, uh, we collected, uh, we did focal samples uh, um, because anybody who's ever worked with Gene Altman knows that focal samples are the way to go. Um, this is Ayla Roberts who uh, worked on this project as a postdoc and helped really is responsible for it ever getting beyond uh, my ideas and ambitions to an actual project. We collected fecal samples. Um, these are two of our research assistants who are celebrating uh, the um, acquisition of a fecal sample from a small infant named Coral. So, uh, we, we treat all of our data in exactly the same way. And then I worked with Linda Vigilant and a wonderful postdoc uh, from her lab, Veronica Steadley, uh, to do the paternity analyses. And Veronica's name will be mentioned many times today. So we had these two very simple um, alternative predictions. If it's parenting effort, then the paternity of the current infant will predict bond strength between the male and the female. Um, and if it's mating effort, then bond strength will predict the paternity of the next infant. Okay, so I don't expect anyone to be on the edge of their seats at this point. Uh, there's a very strong um, uh, body of evidence which shapes our ideas about what we're most likely to see, but we are going to, um, we're going to just, it's just you have to, you know, the data matter. So let's look at all of the boons, let's collect the data, let's see if they do what we think they're going to do. All right, so we have, we, we collected and analyzed behavioral data on male-female uh, patterns of interactions between males and females uh, when females were uh, fully swollen during their conception cycles. We, you know, able to identify those periods uh, retrospectively. Oops. 
We can monitor and assess their relationships when females are pregnant. And we can monitor, assess the relationships when females are lactating. Okay, so these are the raw behavioral data. And so then we can use the data then to, um, to examine our predictions. So um, not, su not surprisingly, uh, we find that um, uh, the um, pattern of relationships, the strength of social bonds when females are fully swollen during the conception cycle influences the likelihood that a male will sire that female's infant. So males who are with females a lot during the period when the female's likely, uh, during the period of, of conception are more likely to sire her infants. And we also see a moderate effect of male rank on the likelihood of siring offspring. We also see that uh, relationships, well differentiated relationships between males and females emerge when females are pregnant, although the absolute rate of interaction is much lower during pregnancy. And we also see, as we expect, that there are well differentiated relationships between males and females during lactation. And so the what these uh, violin graphs show you is that the strength of female's relationship to her top ranked partner, here these brown ones, is considerably higher than the strength of a relationship to her second ranked partner, which is uh, the pattern that we normally see when we analyze um, rates of interactions between males uh, and females. And although our methods are slightly different than the methods that our smuts originally used, um, they're very consistent in the, in the general uh, patterns that emerge. Okay, so here uh, what we have are the posterior distributions uh, about um, uh, the um, relationship between paternity and uh, uh, strength of social bonds or the magnitude of the dyadic sociality index, which is based on a combination of association and grooming and um, uh, friendly vocalizations like grunts. And uh, the little hills show you the posterior distributions for different categories of males. And so we can actually evaluate the mating effort and parenting effort hypotheses with these data. So the blue hills are sires of the current infant. And what you can see is that during pregnancy and lactation, uh, sires of the current infant um, are, have stronger ties to females than, um, than do other males. And the pink uh, hills uh, represent sires of the next infant. So we don't know that for all of our, um, all of our, our uh, conceptions, but we do know it for about half of them. So um, you can see that paternity of the present infant is a much better predictor of the strength of the relationship between males and females than paternity of the next infant. So these primary associates are largely sires of the present infant and the strength of the relationship between uh, the male and the female does not seem to be very strongly related to uh, paternity of the next infant. So this is then entirely consistent with the work from Amicelli and from uh, Moremi and from uh, the Chakmas in uh, Namibia. Okay. Uh, and we also, uh, in some subsequent analyses uh, have shown that uh, the relationships between females and males also extend to interactions with the female's infants. So primary associates, primary associates interact with their partner's infants at much higher rates than other males do. Okay, so, so far no surprises. 
uh, uh, primary associates are often sires of their partner's offspring. So these are the data I showed you before, and now I've just added the olive data. And so across the board from our, from our sample, um, about 37% of the primary associates are sires of their, um, of their partner's current infants. Okay, so, and that's oddly similar to the value from yellow baboons. Okay, so far so good. Everything's really consistent. You've learned absolutely nothing so far. So you're wondering why you're here. Okay, but if you're interested in adaptation and you're thinking about uh, selection acting on, uh, on uh, male parenting effort, um, these numbers, at least the numbers from uh, Moremi, Ambicelli, and uh, Lycupia ought to worry you just a little bit. And that's because there's a ton of mismatches. You know, so, okay, great. So sires are, are um, participating in these relationships more often than you'd expect by chance, but they're getting it wrong a lot of times, it seems to me, you know, I mean, Better than random? Okay, but not that great. At least that's what I thought about when I looked at the data. And it's not just that our yellow, all of baboons are getting it wrong, but it looks like a lot of places males are getting it wrong. So this then raises two questions. The first question is, why don't all sires become primary associates? Why are some guys uh, what I like to think of as deadbeat dads. What are they doing? Where are they? And um, the second question is, why do non-sires become primary associates? What's going on with these guys? You know, because every time there's a mismatch, it means that both these questions arise. Some sires are not doing what, what maybe we think he ought to be doing, and some guys are doing it. So what's up with that? Okay, so the rest of what I want to talk about is attempts to answer those two questions with our data uh, from uh, Lycipia. So why don't sires become primary associates? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. We know that males don't necessarily stay in groups forever. They go from one group to another, they disperse from one group to another, and they may do that once or twice or several times during the year. Um, so maybe guys are dispersed. So the three possibilities really are they're dead. Okay, that happens. It's sad, but it happens. Uh, they've dispersed or they're disinterested for some reason. Okay, um, they're not there for some reason. And um, I wondered what those reasons were. Okay, so the first possibility that they're dead or dispersed is entirely possible but turns out not really to explain the data. So this is just uh, basically a kind of survivorship graph where we look at the probability that the sire will remain in the group. And this is, the red line is about when kids are weaned in our population. So based on this, most of these guys are there. They're present in the group, but they're not becoming primary associates. So the puzzle remains, we haven't explained it. So um, it occurred to us that maybe what's going on is that male tactics shift as males age. And the empirical basis for this um, idea comes out of um, data from many sites, but Certainly, I think the nicest data come from Ambicelli. I think all the nicest data come from Ambicelli. It's just a perpetual frustration. Um, anyway, so uh, Susan Alberts and colleagues have shown us very clearly that male age and paternity peak when males are in their physical prime, somewhere between eight and 10 years of age in the yellow baboon population. Okay, and this is, uh, you can see similar graphs like this in many other um, uh, species that live in um, 
non-paraliving species, in not just in primates, but in many other taxa. Okay, so this is a kind of standard uh, life story for males. And so what I was thinking is that maybe uh, the trade-offs between mating effort and parenting out effort the really change as males age. And so when males are young, it's all about achieving high rank and mating with females, attempting to mate with females. Because um, if you're going to be successful in achieving high rank, it's gonna happen when you're fairly young. And then afterward, you're just cruising down this curve, right? Your rank is dropping, your chances of souring offspring are dropping. And so then the relative payoffs from parenting and effort and mating effort might look quite different. So the idea is that the payoffs derived from mating effort and parenting effort might change as males pass through these stages in their life history. So we went to look at our data from Lycipia and we see a similar uh, relationship between male age and male dominance rank. So that males are most likely to achieve high rank between the ages of about eight and 10. We see a similar relationship between uh, the probability of siring offspring and male age. So males are most likely to sire offspring when they're about between eight and 10, sort of towards nine-ish nine maybe. And then this steady decline. So here's poor Pierce. He's 13 years old. Things do not look good. He's way down there at the bottom. So what should Piers do with himself now? Well, it looks like older males are more likely to form these, kind, these primary associations than younger males are. So holding paternity constant, these older males are more likely to invest in relationships with females and their offspring. So, one of the answers then is that uh, the male's likelihood of forming primary associations changes as they mature and older males are more likely to form primary associations than younger males are, all other things being held constant. So I think that's part of the answer or a that explains some of the uh, variation in male behavior. So older males are more likely to be forming these kinds of relationships with females and their offspring. So we still need to explain a piece of the puzzle, which is that there are males who become primary associates uh, that the genetic data tell us are not sires. And the question is why they do that. And one of the um, hypotheses uh, that's in the literature and seems entirely plausible is that maybe males are confused about paternity. We know that sometimes consortships change there are consort takeovers. We know that males may walk away from consorts with females and other males uh, take up consorts. We know that females will mate with more than one male uh, when they're uh, likely to conceive. So maybe males just don't know for sure who their infants are. And the behavioral proxies that they rely on are not completely accurate. And this is an explanation that was put forward uh, for in Miramie. Uh, uh, and uh, yet there's some question about that because um, in Miramie, they could show that uh, non-sires were often, had often mated with females or mate guarded females during their conception cycles. But in Nia Wynn's analysis in Ambicelli, she didn't find that to be true, but it seems possible. So we looked at our data and we examined 
uh, uh, a measure of, of uh, mating effort or intensity of mating effort or access to uh, sexually receptive females, conceiving females to kind of look at this idea. So we looked at how often males approached females who were fully swollen during their conception cycles. And what we see is that sires who are, uh, whether or not they become the primary associate, uh, are much more likely to approach females, to have approached females when they were um, uh, fully swollen during their conceptive cycles than non-sires. And these um, uh, um, pink ones are males who are not the sire, but become primary associates. So the behavioral signal for sires and these other guys seems pretty clearly different. Okay, you can't rule it out. Uh, they may have, um, you know, they may just be diluted, um, but there's a pretty clear behavioral signal there, which makes us skeptical of that and to look for alternative explanations. And so this is an analysis that has been uh, led by uh, my wonderful postdoc, Veronica Steadley. And Veronica had the idea uh, that, that what we've, that an idea that, that fits with observations of uh, these relationships between males and offspring. So um, a number of people for many years have observed that relationships between males and infants last for a long time. So there's lovely data in Julie Johnson's dissertation from Gilgil where she followed infants that had been previously studied by uh, Nancy Nicholson, who studied infants that were actually sired uh, uh, during the time when Barbara Sputz did her work. And what she found is some of these relationships between males and kids lasted three or four years, which uh, prompted Veronica to wonder whether or not these guys who were not sires of the current infant who are forming primary associations with females might actually be the sires of the previous infant, okay? So the question was, are these, what is the, how does past paternity history, previous paternity history influence the likelihood of becoming a primary associate? So this is what the data look like. So the probability of becoming a primary associate for a male who is a sire of both the previous infant and the current infant is extremely high. If you are the sire of the previous infant, but not the sire of the current infant, you are about half as likely to become the primary associate. However, you can see the overlap here that they're almost identical. So siring the current infant, but not the past infant, and siring the previous infant, but not the current infant, have about an equal impact. And if you sired neither infant, you're very unlikely to become the primary associate. So we think that these data help us to understand why non-sires become primary associates. We think this reflects their past paternity history. And um, we think this is, um, uh, I mean, it's a very strong, very strong pattern in our data. And of course, we don't know if, it, if this is a robust effect that will be seen in other populations, but we think it might be part of the story. And one of the implications of this that's really interesting to us is that if this is common, then it means that these relationships between males and females can last for a really long time. So this is, these are the sort of demographic statistics for our population. Females cycle for about two months. They get pregnant, they stay pregnant for about six months. They lactate and in our population, uh, interbirth intervals are quite short because the baboons uh, have access to an invasive cactus which um, reduces the seasonality in their food supply. 
So they're getting weaned when they're about seven months old, which is very young. Uh, mom cycles for two months, she gets pregnant, she lactates. But this means that some of these primary associations are extending over more than two years. So these are very stable, long-term relationships, which are mediated through um, infants. So it's the relationship between the male, the female, and the infant that sustains these relationships. And I think that I really like um, a phrase that uh, I think Nia Wynn introduced, which is uh, she describes this as joint parental care. And I think that is what the baboons are showing us, that there is this investment in joint parental care, which is quite extended. And a number of people have pointed out that aside from the threat to infanticide, which may favor the formation of these relationships, another important benefit that males might be able to provide for their infants is they can protect them, accompany them, and support them during this difficult period when the infant is moving away from its mother and she becomes involved with her next infant. So now the kid's out there on their own. And if they have this male companion, this may provide an important uh, buffer against competition and danger. And that's not a new idea, but it makes sense in this context. So males then may maintain these more extended relationships with females over the course of several pregnancies and, um, and reproductive cycles. So what do we think we know? We think that in olive baboons, as in yellow and chakma baboons, primary associations reflect parenting effort rather than mating effort. I mean, it's obvious that there could be some overlap here, but the evidence for parenting effort is much stronger than the evidence for mating effort. We're seeing older males investing more in parenting effort than younger males. And we're seeing that the mismatches uh, between paternity and uh, forming primary associations reflects males past paternity history, the male and the female's uh, history of their relationship and the male having sired previous infants. And that in at least some of these cases, the males are forming enduring ties to mothers of their offspring. And I think uh, from a broader perspective, these data are interesting uh, beyond the small world of uh, Savannah baboons. And I think they're interesting for two reasons. One is that I think they remind us that um, our tendency to think in binary ways, to think that, in, that things are black and white may be um, ignores the actual complexity uh, that natural selection has um, has built. And so every, uh, so males are constantly uh, trading off mating effort and parenting effort. And sometimes those trade-offs are, um, are really asymmetric. So it's all mating effort and it's very little parenting effort. And sometimes it's more evenly balanced and sometimes it shifts where there's a lot more parenting effort than mating effort. But it's this sort of continuum that seems um, uh, really interesting to, to unpack. And so, you know, I don't think that, um, I, I think of this work as um, filling in some of the gaps in what we know about male uh, reproductive strategies in baboons and perhaps more generally. Um, and, uh, uh, Ed Yong wrote a wonderful piece about the coronavirus, and uh, he uh, 
uh, he wrote that science and you know the process itself is a slow erratic stumble toward ever less uncertainty. And it seems like that's a pretty great goal for, for and uh, I like this idea. And so I think this work is, is um, in that tradition and has been quite satisfying. Um, I need to acknowledge um, the people that made, uh, that created all this data and made the project possible. So Shirley Strum and Ayla Roberts, uh, who um, uh, uh, helped so much with getting this project off the ground. The Oasu Nguro project staff who were immensely help helpful to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a whole suite of people who collected detailed behavioral data and uh, collected feces and uh, generated the data uh, that I now get to play with. Um, uh, they've all been uh, a huge asset and it's been great to work with all of them. And um, this is um, uh, my current graduate, Sam um, Patterson, who has wonderful data on uh, um, maternal effects, which you guys should be interested in. And uh, the lab work, uh, the, the work done at the Max Planck by Veronica Steadley and Linda Vigilant. And then we've received a lot of very valuable statistics help from Brendan Barrett and Richard McElrath, all at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. So um, I want to thank you for uh, coming and uh, being with me today. And um, I hope you guys have some questions that we can handle now. Great, thank you, Joan, that was really wonderful. Uh, there are actually, uh, I guess, about nine questions here. Right. Um, let's start with, the, and some of them then you partially answered throughout, but there's still some remaining. The first question uh, is from uh, Hana Koko, who asks, um, do males who become primary associates mate with multiple females in the same season? And if they regularly or at least occasionally do, then they're in a situation where they can or must choose to become a primary associate associate with with one female or another and so then the question becomes uh is does your data allow uh you to analyze not only the paternity situation of an existing primary associate but also the hypothetical ones that could have formed based on mating but didn't so that would allow you then to compare mismatch likelihoods that wouldn't that would have happened with other choices versus the ones actually made essentially i think the the, the question is can you distinguish between um not just is the is the do they match better than expected by random chance with all males, but specifically better than than females that they made it with? Okay, um, so I'm not 100% sure that I entirely get what Hana is aiming at. Um, so. Um, most of the analyses so far have been done from the perspective of females. Who's a female's primary associate and what is her relationship to him and what's his relationship to her infants? But we're currently working on um, a series of analyses from the male's perspective, which is actually much harder to organize and structure. And um, it's complicated because a male does have at any one point in time, a variety of things that he may be doing. He may be the primary associate of one female with a young infant at the same time that there are other females who are cycling and likely to conceive. And the question, one question we're trying to think about and uh, work on is, um, how do males apportion their, um, uh, their, their effort toward um, um, uh, alternative opportunities? And is there really a trade-off? Can we see a trade-off between parenting effort and mating effort? Um, I don't think that's quite what Han is getting at. Um, and you have an idea about that, Matt, or how? Well, I think the question. So you said that you know there, at one point I think you said that that they uh, that the matching between sires and and the infants is better than random, 
Yeah. And and is that is that that they're better than random compared to all males in the population taken at random, or is it specifically better than random given that a male mated with a female? All males in the population, the likelihood of patriciring the infant is is strongly predicted by the um, pattern of association during that period. Um, and um, the problem is that um getting a handle on matings is harder than getting a handle on other aspects of behavior because matings are rare relatively rare and the chance you'll actually see the mating is um somewhat unlikely and previous analyses have looked at things like the proportion of consort time monopolized um and um, or uh, did they mate guard females? And um, I'm not fond of those measures because they rely on a sort of semi-arbitrary measure of mate guarding. Um, uh, so I think the answer is we can't exactly be sure. And we could interrogate that question more fully with our data. Let's leave it there. Um, it connects to another question, which isn't quite in order, um, which is about recognizing offspring, right? So if we assume that, you know, let's say that males are better at identifying their actual biological offspring than just uh, their offspring that, that could be theirs based on mating patterns, which is supported in part from data from Amicelli. Um, and uh, let's see, Camille uh, Tested asks, how do, how do males recognize their offspring? And so you talked a little bit about this, but I wonder if you might speculate about what mechanisms you think are, uh, are allowing for that. Okay, so there's two interesting observations which about that. One is that these relationships emerge during pregnancy. Okay, and so we don't have the baby. So, um, so they can't be using the phenotypic cues of the infant itself to, um, to shape those relationships. So something is going on before the infant is actually born. So, um, you know, we don't know what the mechanism is, but we suspect it has some, that they're strong, that the mechanism, uh, that, the, that the formation of these relationships is strongly influenced by the male-female male behavior uh, at the time of conception. Um, it would be really, really interesting to know whether or not there are uh, changes or differences in the selectivity of these relationships uh, between pregnancy and lactation when you do have the infant uh, and you could, you know, pick it up and smell it, mm -hmm. look at it and say, you know, this just doesn't look like mine. Um, and there's all kinds of evidence for the use of phenotypic information in paternal kin recognition. Uh, and we don't know that about these baboons. But, but the, I think the fact that they're emerging during pregnancy is quite interesting in terms of mechanisms. Well, I, and I don't know, maybe I'll have used my moderator powers here and I'll ask, uh, it, it seems like then if the idea is that these are beneficial to the males, right? That the benefits are also accruing during pregnancy. Yes, and, absolutely. Anti uh, anti um, um, uh, uh, feticide mechanisms. So we think. I mean, why do you need this relationship during pregnancy? And I think your work on feticide, uh, uh, we cite we cite that work um, uh, suggests that that things can happen to females when they're pregnant uh, that will impact the male's uh, reproductive um, success. So if she loses, if she if she terminates the pregnancy if she's stressed during pregnancy, anything that will affect the viability of the, of the fetus is uh, important to the male. So we think it's uh, quite plausible. And, and we're not the first to report that these relationships emerge during pregnancy. It's also seen in the chakras. Uh, here's a question from uh, Lisa Danish, which is generally about the benefits that the males are accruing. Um, and, and you answered that in large part, but I wonder, um, what data you have to actually evaluate whether those benefits are actually are actually there? How, how much safer is an infant? Do those data exist? And, and are you optimistic they might exist in the future? Oh, I'm always optimistic about the future. Um, okay, so connecting up 
primary associations to infant fitness is uh, very difficult at the moment. We have no evidence that infants who have these kinds of relationships with males do better. We do know that male presence, that sire's presence in the group has some impact on development of kids. And that's from work um, that Marie Charpentier uh, led uh, in, with the Ambicelli database. But unfortunately, we don't have the triangulation of sire presence, nature of the relationship between the male and the infant or the male and the mother to say that the relationship itself matters. I mean, a little bit hard to know whether or not males, I mean, and they discuss this in the paper. How do we know this isn't something about phenotypic quality, right? So maybe that's why male presence and infant development are, are related. So that's a big hole. We don't know. Uh, it's plausible, but just because it's plausible doesn't mean it's true. And that's something that, um, so one of the, it's always true that when you do new analyses, um, you often raise new questions. And so I think that's the missing, missing, that's a gap for the literature. And I think it's, I think it's um, potentially um, that gap could be addressed with data. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, here's a question from EPW who asks, uh, how do you separate the increase in uh, primary associations with male age from the increase in tenure in the group? If older males are potentially dispersing less and staying in the group, do they just have more opportunities to build primary associations? So that would be true uh, and a concern and male availability uh, is an important factor in the development of these relationships. So for example, if you look at data from the, um, from Chakmas in uh, De Hoop, I believe, uh, the likelihood that the putative sire is still present when the infant is born and still present by the time the infant is weaned is considerably lower than it is in, um, in our population. Um, and that's because that there's more turnover. But in our population, these guys are there. They're just not forming these relationships. So we're not very worried about, about the impact of male tenure. And we have actually um, adjusted for that in our analyses. Yeah. Um, maybe two more here. Uh, Jason uh, Camilar asks, um, I may have missed this, but would you expect these association patterns to also vary in response to interpopulational variation in infanticide risk? Well, one of the things, one of the things that's really interesting is that we were all um, that, that when we when they did the work in Moraine, it seemed um, clear that these relationships with lactating females uh, might be super important because of the high rate of infanticide in Moraine. But the relationships look really similar in yellow baboons and olive baboons where the risk of infanticide is just much lower. It's not non-existent, uh, but certainly the, um, the incidence of infanticide is much lower in yellows and olives. So um, what seems, so these relationships even if you, I mean, you can, you can imagine a scenario in which these relationships evolved originally in a population which infanticide was common, uh, but they've been preserved in populations in the absence of a really high risk of infanticide. So um, I think what I'm actually very interested in uh, thinking about variation among the Savannah baboons uh, uh, on the basis of um, uh, differences that we see in rates of infanticide, uh, male tenure, and the extent of male reproductive skew, things like that. I think that's really interesting, a really interesting um, landscape to explore. 
So one of the things that's interesting is the form of the relationship seems quite similar uh, across sites. And, um, and so that's kind of a kind of interesting and an interesting puzzle. It says that it's not all about infanticide, although it might be really important in the chakmas. And perhaps one final question where we can uh, get you to speculate a little bit about uh, relationships mm -hmm. between uh, humans and non-human primates. Um, from Elisa Fernandez Fue uh, Fueyo, who says, uh, this explanation for the reason why males form the association with the female and his infant uh, remind her of the grandmother hypothesis for the evolution of menopause in humans. So I wonder if you might just connect your work to here to, to the grandmother and mothering hypothesis and uh, how you think those connect, if at all. Okay. All right. So this is my chance. So I um, had thought about that and I am struck by the parallels. And I wrote about that in the paper that uh, we just published on the effects of male age. But some reviewer, who was actually a great reviewer, gave lots of useful suggestions, just wouldn't bite on that, just would not tolerate that. So that came out of the paper. So now I will tell you my true thoughts, which is that I think it's super interesting if you go back to that graph um, of, um, of paternity, so uh, I mean of, of um, yeah paternity and male age. So there's this long period in males' lives where they're not siring any kids, right? What are they doing? You know. So there is, I think, in baboons, and maybe we should think more broadly about other primates, a substantial post-reproductive lifespan. And if you look at differences in lifespan of male and female baboons, say their males' uh, lifespans are not as long, but there's not a big difference. So I think this period is correctly described as a post-reproductive lifespan. And I think that there are meaningful parallels between uh, the what people discuss as the grandfather, the, the grandmother hypothesis in humans and what we see in baboons. And um, although this reviewer wouldn't let me say this in the paper, um, I think in thinking about humans, I think it's really important to, to, to take data from a really, from everywhere we can to get insights about our very peculiar life history and mating system because we're an N of one, okay? And um, we see in humans some really interesting um, life history strategies and reproductive pins. And the question is, what are the what are the kinds of selective pressures that have that have favored these? And um, I think it's really useful to, to get insights about the kinds of selective pressures that have operated in other animals to create these kinds of patterns. And I think, for example, uh, with res respect to humans, um, we think it's uh, interesting to think about what uh, we call uh, you know, alternative pathways to paternal care. Here we're seeing paternal care in a non-parabonded primate. And we think that's an important thing to think about in the context of trying to think about how male parental care evolved in hominin ancestors. Great, well, I think that was uh, a wonderful place to leave it. Uh, you wrote some grant text there for everyone's next NIH grant proposal. Go for it. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, Joan, and thanks everyone for, for tuning in uh, next week. We'll be here at the same time uh, with uh, Dr. Ellen Ketterson, and we'll hope to see you all then. Uh, thanks very much, Joan. You're welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>